Have you ever wondered how I make animations like this? Or this? Or this? Well, the answer is I make them with math, like this equation for this animation. Or this animation equation double. Or this. But what do these equations mean? Well, today I thought we'd have a lighter video, where we just explore different animations using math. But first, we need to learn the rules before we animate them. So to start, imagine a cube. Except you don't have to imagine, because I put it right there on your screen right now, you're welcome! This cube has some kind of coordinate, so an x-coordinate telling us how far right it is. The more right, the higher the number. The more left, the lower the number. Y-coordinate telling us the exact same thing except for forwards backwards, so the more forward, higher up. And Z-coordinate telling us how far up it is. So far it should be simple enough, and you can see that as I move the cube around, these three values change. Okay, cool, but position is not the end of the story, we also have the material of the cube. So if I just uh, brighten up a bit, we can begin our fun with the looks by starting with the color. So basically, we have three values. Red, green and blue. The higher the red, the redder it is. The higher the green, the greener, and the higher the blue, the bluer. It's, well, it's color, please. Now these are the basics, but it's time to have some fun. So first, how can you automate this? Well, we can start by using shader nodes to plug in the X coordinate into the red color, Y into green, Z into blue, like this. Right here we have the coordinate, splitting into X, Y, Z, plugging in into red, green, blue. Now we could just plug it directly, but I'd like to break it down for the sake of clarity. And now you can see that as we move the cube around, the color changes. It really is that simple. Okay, but I promised animations with math. And even though we will get there eventually, I'd like to introduce some right away to show you how we can mathify things. That's why allow me to introduce you to the math node. So basically, we can connect a math node in between the blue and Z for example, set it to multiply and multiply it by 10. So just to really make sure that we all understand what is happening, right here this node tells us that we start with the position of our cube. Then we break it down into three separate components, and then we set the red to the value of x, green to the value of y, and then we take z, multiply by 10, and set blue to the value of z, resulting in the color of our cube. Now what's gonna happen if I move the cube around? Well, it's going to be a lot more blue! Because whilst our other colors are still themselves, blue is literally 10 times bigger. That's why 10 times bluer. Now we're not done yet, we can do more fun stuff. For example, instead of multiplying it, we can divide it. We can add 5, we can bring it to the third power, or even through a sine wave. There are a lot of options. Another thing I should mention is that we can plug in two things into the node. So for example, if instead of plugging them into colors, we plug them into brightness, and then just add x to y, which we then add to z, what's gonna happen? Well, the further right, the further forward, and further up you put the cube, the brighter it will become. So basically, the further from the origin, the brighter the cube. Right? Well, not quite. That's because coordinates can also be negative. So if we move the cube left, then its brightness becomes negative, and it's sucking in the light. So if we wanted to create an animation in which the further the cube is from the center, the brighter it becomes, how do we do that? I'll give you a second to think about it. Well, knowing how a massive portion of my audience is made up of mathematicians, you probably came up with the obvious solution already. That is, Pythagorean theorem. So basically, if you imagine a triangle, it basically states that the square of this side plus the square of this side is equal to the square of the hypotenuse. Now we can just extend it to three dimensions by just doing it again. This is our first side, second side, third side. This means that our total equation could be summarized like this. x squared plus y squared plus z squared square root. So we take our coordinates, we square them, then add them, and then take the square root. Now as we move the cube around, the further it is from the origin, the brighter it becomes, but there is more than one way to skin a cat here. Another way, for example, is we can add them together again, but this time, since the problem last time was them being negative, we can just take the absolute value. This will fulfill our requirement of the further away, the brighter, but in a different way. This time we're not measuring the distance, only adding them all together. Okay, so this might have been a pretty long introduction, but what we basically end up here with is two equations which let us create a shader that makes the cube brighter the further there is. And I know it may seem a bit difficult to see because of the nodes, but on the end of the day,
These are equations. That's actually what I like so much about nodes in Blender, because you can also use scripts in Python, but that's programming. Right here, it's almost like programming. Except there are no calls or loops, which means it's basically math equations. Which means even though those two may seem different from those two, this is just a matter of notation. They mean the same thing. So yeah, everything we'll do today will seem kind of unrelated, but it will be just math, with us using animations as notation. That said, let's do one more thing as an exercise. So here's the deal. Let's say that we need a shader in which as we move the cube further away, it oscillates between purple and yellow. How do we do it? Well, I'll give you two second to think about it. Okay, got it? First, for the purpose of visualizing it better, I'll add a plane with a color that the cube would be if it was in that position. So if the color would look like this, then as we move the cube around, it fits the color just, just for the purpose of visualizing it. Now first, we can start by adding X and Y coordinates and using that for brightness. Now we can see that the higher up you go, the brighter it gets, which, yeah, that makes sense. Now we can take this and using Pythagorean theorem, we can get the distance. So far, everything seems simple. Just take a sign and wave function. Simple enough. Except we don't want a wave of white and black. We want purple and yellow. So how should we add the colors? Well, first, we won't really care about the brightness, so let's replace it with colors right away. We can also introduce two new vectors, a pure yellow color and a pure purple color. Now, what we want is we want some sort of way to pick this vector when the function is equal to 1 and this one when it's negative 1. And it's actually surprisingly simple. We'll start by normalizing it, so we add 1. This way, instead of going from negative 1 to 1, it goes from 0 to 2, and then we divide by 2. Now instead of going from negative 1 to 1, it's going from 0 to 1, which might seem similar, and that's because of this, but it just makes things easier. Because next, we take yellow and we multiply it by our new function, which means instead of going from black to white, it goes from black to yellow. But what about purple? Well, one way to add purple would be to just add it, literally. Just add a vector of purple, as in addition. The problem there being that our yellow also gets tainted by it and it's no longer pure yellow, which is not something we want. So how do we fix that? Well, right here, this whole portion is kind of like our function telling us where we want yellow. So for purple, we'd like to select everything except places in that function. So one, that's because everything, minus, that's because except, that function. Now we multiply it by purple and add them together. And I know that it might have been a lot, but consider two things. First of all, this step-by-step -step animation showing us everything we've achieved. Starting with coordinates, then Pythagorean, then sine, then multiply by yellow, then inverse, then multiply by purple, and then add them together. I just think that it seems a lot more manageable when you see it step-by-step. -step. And the, the second thing is that this node tree really is just a form of mathematical notation. I can't stress that enough. These two are equivalent. That said, that's kind of all we need exposition-wise. Now we can get into the proper maths. And so next, it will be time for my favorite part. You probably know about thinking with portals, but what I like to do is think with functions. So imagine a plane like this. On this plane, we once again have coordinates represented with brightness. Here you can see the x again, and here you can see the y again. Now we're going to create a function which takes in the coordinate of the pixel and outputs the brightness. What kind of pattern would we like? As a warm-up, let's do a circle. How would we get a circle like this? Well, first, we can, once again, using Pythagorean theorem, convert this into a function of the distance. There. Now, the further we go, the larger the number, the brighter it becomes. This is already quite handy, and we can certainly see that there is some circularity to it. But what we need to get from this circularity is only a certain region. So imagine a single line going from the center. This is kind of like a linear function that's constantly increasing up. And what we'd want is some kind of way to select only a portion of it. So right here, you can see the function of distance to brightness. And we want a function which returns 0 if the distance is from 0 to our distance, 1 if it's in our distance, and 0 if it's above. Now we could do it using greater than and smaller than math nodes in Blender, but that's easy. Let's instead do something fun. Let's try to do it in a single continuous function. Okay, now this is a lot more difficult, Now, I'd really like to encourage you to attempt this yourself. I'll give you a second. 
Okay, so the basic idea looks like this. First, we need the absolute value of a function, so we just square it. The reason why is if we subtract some kind of value before this square, then we can get a sort of U shape, which allows us to already select a circle of darkness. Now we can take advantage of a certain mathematical curve, that is, if you have ever seen an exponential curve, you can clearly see the disconnect between things above one and below one. Meaning that if we square this function, or cube it, or even go to the 8th power, or 16 because why not, this becomes a lot flatter. Now we can invert it by subtracting this from one, and... The pickle here is that we have our bright circle with everything else being in the negative. But that's not what we want. We want our circle to be equal to 1, with other things being 0. So how could we fix it? Well, it's the hyperbolic tangent, of course! The best kind of tangent. This normalizes a function, so that it now oscillates between negative 1 and positive 1, which we can once again easily normalize to 0 by adding 1 and dividing by 2. And there, we got a circle. This is an equation for a circle like this. Isn't that lovely? But that's only in the first case, then we have a wave function. I mostly use it to visualize the wave particle duality of a photon with the double slit experiment, but in order for me to make this kind of animation, we need a function that can behave like a wave in two dimensions. So how? Well, the actual how is, I mean, incredibly simple. Once again, distance using Pythagorean and plug in the sign. The tricky bit comes in the fact that right here it's disappearing on the edges. So how could we achieve that? For that we need some sort of function that starts off with 1 and then slowly disappears to 0, like um, the normal distribution. In this case it's the simplified version, because we don't need anything fancy, but there, that's the equation. And in this case you can see that I added a couple of additional variables, and you'll see what they do soon. But before that, let's try this kind of exercise once again. Let's make a grid. How can we do it? Feel free to pause and think about it for yourself. Okay, got it? No, obviously not. Statistically, you haven't even paused the video to think for a second or subscribe, but that's fine, I'll tell you anyway. When we have that grid, the first step is obviously to realize that the grid is cyclic. We're going from 1 to 0 to 1 to 0 to 1. So obviously, the easiest way to achieve that would be with sine waves. Right here, we have sine waves of x. Right here, we have sine waves of y. So if we add them together, then... Oh, that's um, that's not a grid at all. It's... But the negatives of the sign cancel out the positive of the other one and vice versa, uh, which we can easily fix by taking the absolute value of these signs. After that, we can subtract it from one to invert it, and then we can use the power trick again to make it even more pronounced. And there, that's the grid. Now, the reason why I wanted to show you these three different textures is precisely because they aren't textures at all, they are functions. Meaning that if we just inject a couple variables into them, then we can move the circle, we can increase its size, we can change the size of the grid, we can add extra lines, we can shift the face of the wave, we can change the wavelength, we can change the size, we can add another one to create an interference pattern, and we can see what happens when the face changes for both while the first one is moving and the second one has an oscillating wavelength, and oh my goodness, that is a lot! But the point is, when you describe things in terms of functions, you can change them in a ton of different ways, and you have a lot more control over them. You know their limits, you can analyze them, the advantage is that for things like textures, you don't really have any tools, but once you describe something as a function, all of math opens up, and you can use all the tools to work on them. And with that in mind, we can get into the best of make it segment of the video. So animations I'm most proud of in no particular order whatsoever. So first we can start with... Oh, wait, was that? Oh, is this the sponsored segment? Oh, no, I don't have a sponsor, right? I'm not popular enough. Um, but I do have Patreon, uh, and I'm kind of struggling financially at the moment because I'm trying to do YouTube full time and it's really not working out. I've spent around 200 hours on these videos and... Uh, so if you could support me, that'd be that'd be <clears throat> that'd be great. I mean, if you can't, that's fine too. You can just like the video. I'll be just swell. Anyhow, this is certainly one of the best visualizations I've ever made. It's for how matrices work, and actually, how do matrices work? In order to understand that, we have to start with vectors represented by this arrow. 
Now, vectors is kind of a crucial one because this is not a vector, it's two of them. One representing the basis of our arrow and second one representing the end. I'll skip over how to make this in Blender because it, that's kind of boring and Blender handles the most interesting thing that is rotation in three dimensions for us. So instead, let's focus on visualizing the matrix transform. How would we do it? First, we could start with a vector. If we place the point at the origin, then we can use the second one as our vector to transform. Neat, but what does that vector actually mean? If our vector has three values, something like 5, 3, and 7, what that means is that we take 5 and multiply it by a first basis vector, which looks like this, then 3 multiplied by a second basis vector, and add the two together, then 7 multiply that by a third basis vector, and once again, add. You can see how this process creates a yellow arrow out of red, green, and blue. So once again, from a different angle, we have our basis vectors 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1, and then we multiply each of them by their corresponding value from our original vector. Then we add them together, and there. Okay, pretty simple, but we still like to implement that. So we want to change our arrows so that instead of pointing to x, y, z, it points to x times red, plus y times green, plus z times blue. Now to that you may say, okay, that seems pretty unnecessary, but whatever, we convoluted our vector for no reason, right? It was just simple three numbers and now we convoluted it so that it's three numbers and three vectors for... Because why not? Alright, fine, whatever, whatever. We want to convolute the vector, whatever. But how do we get the matrix transform now? And I am so glad you asked, because in order to now apply a matrix transform to our vector, we need to do... Nothing. That's it. These three vectors... Ah, our vector transforms. Red is the first column, green is the second, blue is the third. Which means that now, if we just move the basis vectors around, we get a new matrix. So here's what happens when we move the red basis around. Green basis, blue basis, our original vector on the x-axis, y-axis, z-axis. It really is that simple. This is what the matrix transforms look like. This is the matrix, this is the vector to transform, this is the transformed vector. That's what I like so much about animating maths. Blender was created by implementing maths using programming. And because of that, if I want to showcase how matrices work, I don't need to spend hours creating a complex system to visualize it with an analogy. No, just use vectors. That's what matrices are. They are just basis vectors. And, and there is a lot more animations I could talk about, like this one or this one or this one, but no. I'd like to finish this video off with something a bit different. This clip from a live stream, and this moment, to be exact. There we go, there we go. Oh my goodness. Okay, I just had a math thought. 11 seconds, that's how long it took me to come up with a math thought, so what was it? Well, I was walking on the background for the video about elementary particles, and I just switched keyframe from Bezier to Linear. What does that mean? Well, different keyframes affect how the animations move. So here we have Bezier, Linear, Cubic, Bounce. So all of them can be described as a certain change of value in relation to time. I switched from Bezier to Linear, and I thought that went on a bit too quickly in the middle. So I was wondering if switching to Linear would slow it down. And here's the thought process. The derivative of a linear function would be just the value. That's because it's a linear function, it's constantly going up. But the derivative of a Bezier would start at zero, since it's flat, and then it would go higher and higher just to fall down again. Now the question is, would this peak be above this line? If it is, that means Bezier is faster in the middle. If it's not, then it's not. So how do we prove it? Well, we can do it by realizing that the integral of a derivative is getting us back to the original function. And since they both end up in the same spot, their integrals have to be the same. Or in other words, the area under these functions has to be equal, which means that this difference has to be offset by this difference. Or in other words, Bezier is going quicker than linear in the middle. And what I like to focus on is that this whole process happened in 11 seconds. 
It, was, it really wasn't a difficult math problem. You see, I really often hear people complaining that all the maths you learn in school is something that we're never going to use, but that's not true. You can use incredibly complex maths in your everyday lives. It's just that most of the time, all of this maths is considered an overkill. Like, yeah, I could just animate everything manually. I could just set these keyframes and I could just check the f***ing animation. It would take around 11 seconds, but it saves time to animate with math. It's easier to use math nodes, and it's better to make sure that an animation is quicker or slower, not only guess, but be certain. And so you won't be ever able to use complex maths in your everyday life if you just close yourself off to it by pretending that it's useless. It can be useful. You can use it. You just need to get used to using it. You can use math for simple problems. And I know that you'd probably have different jobs, and obviously, the whole video was tailored to me because that's how I use math. Your usage would probably be different, but I still encourage you to try. To really try using math. And I hope that I got you inspired seeing how I'm making animations using math. So hi everyone, welcome to the Make It Is Going Mad segment of the video. Yes, this is the last one. I'm hoping you enjoyed the video. Uh, it's been certainly fun to make, talking about animations, talking about animating, how I animate makes things significantly easier. And I won't be lying to you, I, I am kind of struggling financially. I, right now, decided to switch to doing YouTube full-time, which is just a splendid idea. And so that's why, actually, right now we got three videos in two weeks, which is pretty nice, you know, more than one video a month. Uh, the downside being that I, this is what I'm making from my videos. Uh, you know, 150 bucks may seem nice until you realize that it actually carries over to two bucks an hour, which is, um, well, a fair bit below the minimum wage. But yeah, if you'd like to support me, as I mentioned, I have Patreon. Also, just liking and subscribing or watching the videos would, would help a lot. Four Horsemen of Physics is probably my one of my favorite recent videos I've made, and not that many people have seen it, so I really would recommend checking it out. Also, I have Discord. Discord server, we talk about science, and honestly, it's a real fun community out there, so I would really recommend And I stream every single day for charity. Right now, we're collecting money for charity, Prevent Cancer Foundation, and you can just join the live streams, donate if you can. If you can't, it's fine. You can just sit in there, enjoy, and have fun. And I'm off now to make another video. I mean, you know, a video a week isn't easy, so yeah, I have to get on that. And for now, that'll be it. Thank you everyone so much for watching. And have a great day. Bye.